Hello everybody and welcome to yet another Social Blueprint interview. Friends, we are joined today by one of the most influential and recognizable members of our great Jewish community. He is a father, a rabbi, the principal of what I believe is the largest Jewish day school in the Southern Hemisphere, being Mount Scopus Memorial College, and a great Jewish member of our community, Rabbi James Kennard. Good morning. Before we get to the interview itself, I just want to say at The Social Blueprint, we are a lot more than just videos. We have an events calendar, what's happening in the community itself, any type of help and aid in the community. Please go to our site. There's so much more there for you. It's so great to have you here today. One of the most greatest aspects, I believe, of our religion is the cyclicality nature of it. I mean, we just finished with Pesach, we're counting the Omer right now, we're leading up to Shavuos, and we're even in the Hakal year. It's a cyclical nature. And for you, your life is cyclical too. You are on the verge of making Aliyah to the great Yerushalayim. I want to hear what, well, actually, not only are I want to hear, but I want to hear what are your thoughts about moving over there and what does the next chapter of your life look like? Well, thank you. We are planning, please God, to move to Israel sometime next year. My wife is studying for a PhD, so it depends exactly where she's up to in her studies or determine the precise date, but we're excited about that. Um, but sometime next year, please God, we will be moving to Israel. We're looking to settle in Ramat Bet Shemesh, and we're very, very excited about it. Daunted and excited. Daunted because the process is going to be challenging. Yes. The bureaucracy is going to be voluminous. Um, but nevertheless, we fundamentally believe, we've always believed, that Israel is the place to be. Right. That we want to be part of Jewish destiny. And Jewish destiny, we have to admit, is being forged in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv much, much more than it is in Melbourne and Sydney. Right. And we want to be part of that story, and we want to make our own contribution to that story. Also, on a very personal level, we have three children and lots of grandchildren living in Israel. And what the future will look like for, for us, I don't know exactly. I hope to stay involved in the educational field. Right. Not to be principal of a school. I think I've done that. <laughs> um, but to give shiurim, to be involved as a consultant. There are many educational um, options, and I hope to be involved in some of them. Right. Incredible. And is it also, you strike me as somebody that is a very goal-oriented person. Is it a little bit daunting to not necessarily know precisely what you're going to do? Yes, it is. I mean, uh, a Jew is never at a loss for something to do because I can always take a safer a book off the shelf and read it. Um, and to be honest, I'm looking forward to slowing down. Okay. I'm looking forward to doing my own thing a little bit more, to indulge my loves of Torah, of history, of maths, and to learn more about all of those, to spend more time with the children and the grandchildren. Um, but in terms of where I'll actually end up professionally, yes, it's a little bit daunting, but also a little bit exciting to think that there are various options open. Great. But Rabbi, you're not leaving us just yet. Say for the next six months or so, are there any achievements that you'd like to see, especially at Mount Scopus? Well, I'm, as you say, I'm principal of Mount Scopus till the end of this calendar year. Um, and I'm 100% on the job. Um, I, when I started in Mount Scopus, I said that I believed in evolution, not revolution. And uh, I think that's been my hallmark. Um, over 17 years that I've been at Mount Scopus. And I don't envisage any grand changes. Right. I envisage to keep running the ship in a, in a professional and efficient way to help the teachers, to help the students to grow and learn. So all the things that we've been doing for a long time, yeah. that's what I see carrying on. Right. And I guess, you know, as you said, 17 years ago, you came here and it was a big decision. Did you think at the time you have had a huge impact on this Jewish community, not just Scopus, but the, the Jewish community writ large? Did you anticipate that? Well, it's very kind of you to say that. Um, I'm not sure I would necessarily agree, but, but let me tell you a story. Um, when I was approached by Mount Scopus, um, somebody who had previously been involved in the, American, sorry, in the Australian community, now lives in America, came to persuade me to take up the job. And he said to me the following. He said, do you know about tropical fish? I said, of course I know about tropical fish. And he said, how big are they? I said, they're little, like that. He said, no, you see, you're thinking of tropical fish in a little tank. But if you go to the barrier reef, you see tropical fish out in the wild, and they've grown very big. 
And he said, tropical fish have the ability to grow as big as the environment lets them. And he said to me that when I was in London, where I lived before coming right. to Melbourne, I was in a small tank and not able to have much impact. Right. But Australia represents a wide open ocean. And he said that he thought I would grow and have more impact and be able to do more things. And I didn't necessarily believe him at the time, <laughs> but I hope that I've had some impact on the Scopus community and on the wider Jewish community, and I hope it's been beneficial. And no, the answer to your question is I didn't really envisage exactly how it would pan out right. all those years ago. Right, but it really has been incredible the, just how much the community has evolved. And I wanted to turn, maybe turn it now into like leadership. Because leadership is one of the big questions, and this is not just a Jewish question, this is a, gl a global question right now. Uh, you are a leader of the community, whether you want to admit it or not, in those ways. I, I had a couple of questions about leadership per se. And again, coming back to the point of, I was looking up research on leadership of the top leaders for the last hundred years. And sadly, the two names that come up, number one and number two, are Winston Churchill and Martin Luther King. And this is in a lot mm -hmm. of different searches that I did, which is pretty pathetic considering that it's been a hundred years. How do you approach leadership and what are your thoughts about it? And then I'll get maybe a little bit more specific. I'm just thinking of the impact of the, the two names that you came up with. <laughs> okay. I think um, the hallmark of both Winston Churchill and Martin Luther King were they were brilliant communicators. And right. in very, very different ways, they were able to speak to their constituency and to a wider world right. in a way that people listened. So in terms of what I see as leadership and the, the, the little bit of experience of leadership that I've had, I'd say number one right up there is communication, okay. is the ability to articulate a vision and to articulate a path that people can follow you along which they will achieve that vision. And it's certainly the case that both Winston Churchill and Martin Luther King were able to do that um, and have left an, uh, a great impact on the world as a result. Um, in more practical terms, moving perhaps from leadership to management, um, leadership stroke management is about how one gets the best out of one's staff, the people whom one is working with. Yes. Um, and I hope I've tried to do that at Mount Scopus, um, to allow people to grow into their positions, to give them a lot of freedom, but at the same time that there should be some accountability, and to generate a collegiality that people work and grow and achieve together. Um, I, I'm sure there are plenty of examples of people who do this very, very well in our community. Right. I think what our community lacks in a slightly different um, aspect is overall strategic leadership. Okay. There's a little bit going on in Sydney where there's a, um, a single fundraising body which also provides some strategic insight uh, and some professional strategic leadership to look at the future of the community. Right. There's nothing like that here in Melbourne. There's a lot of individual fiefdoms many of which are doing fantastic work. Yes. But I think the education sector and I think the welfare sector and indeed the entire community would benefit from what it currently lacks, which is some overall strategic leadership. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And it, it's cer certainly we have spoken with a number of people in Sydney and it is quite different up there. Uh, so it's certainly an area for growth for us. I, I also wanted to ask about leadership. Leadership is also about making calls and I have two questions about it, which is, number one, how do you keep your same values at the same time as understanding like you're working with a greater audience and keeping some type of happy medium, if you will? It's, it's a challenge, but I think it's very important to know what, one princi what one's principles are, right? Um, which I think can be translated as to know where the red lines are that one will not cross, Okay. Um, which means if one's got the ability to make the decision to make sure that the red line is not crossed. Right. And if one's in an organization where one is told to cross a line, then one knows that's the time to leave an organization. And I think, thank God that hasn't happened to me, right. but I think that's um, the key way to ensure that principles are always remain sacrosanct. Um, another thing I think is to consult widely. Right. And I think uh, in my decision-making role at, at Scopus, Sometimes I feel it's a decision for the principal to make alone. Right. And sometimes it's very much a decision to be made in consultation with other colleagues. Interesting. Yeah. So there, so you do ratchet what is give and take, so to speak. Yes. Yes. 
No, that, that's a great point for sure. Yeah, when, when I started, I, I said to my colleagues on the senior leadership team, and I think I've stuck with this, that there will be some decisions that after the principal to make. There'll be some decisions where I'll go in to consult, but I have a clear direction already. Yes. And there'll be some decisions where I have no direction. It really is a genuine discussion, and from that will evolve a policy. Um, I think part of the, the skill is to know which decisions fit into category one, two, or three. And I've tried to get the balance right. Yeah, well, it's amazing. It also goes back to your point about communication. Mm -hmm. You communicated those three buckets to people so they know where you stand. Correct. Yes, that's quite right. I never thought about it in those words. That's really important. Mm -hmm. And that there is a time for a leader to just make the decision. And there has to be, because otherwise they're, they're not a leader. There has to be things in, as you call them, the buckets, in one and two and three. And if, if the yeah. balance isn't right, then the leadership isn't right. Right. And then, you know, I guess it leads to the question of how do you handle internally? You're going to make then inevitably calls that other people don't agree with. How do you have that mental fortitude to just stick with it when you know you're going to take some blowback? So sometimes it's hard. Um, our parents are a wonder of our school are a wonderful body. Yes. And we're blessed to work with them in the sacred task of raising their children. But there's a bug coming. Yeah, I knew it. <laughs> but sometimes parents can be quite vociferous. Sure. And sometimes parents don't see all the factors that we see. Um, a school is a large system. And if you make a little change here, it impacts in lots and lots of other ways, yes. as systems do. And sometimes parents and other people cannot see all those little implications. Yes. And they just see it in a, in a more isolated way. Um, we live in an age of social media. And uh, my occasional forays into sharing my thoughts on Facebook lead to quite unpleasant trolling. Um, and one has to have the fortitude to know that there will be opponents and right. people will have, let's put it politely, a different idea. Right. And they might express that vociferously. But to be a leader is to make decisions. Um, a leader who doesn't make decisions or just follows is not a leader. And an organization needs a leader to make decisions. So the answer without uh, great wisdom yeah. or without a great formula is to know that you're doing the right thing and have, as you say, the fortitude to go through with it. Um, you can't do that too often. If you're constantly getting brickbats or worse, then, right. then it means you have to stop. But um, like, like most things, I look back on my time at Scopus, or, which is still going on, but the, uh, the, the last 16 and a half years, and there's been a lot of decisions that I've had to make, most yeah. of which I think I've got right, perhaps some I've got wrong. Um, and you have to know that if you're in that position, if you're privileged enough to be in that position, then people sometimes disagreeing with you is part of the baggage that you have to bear. Understood. And, you know, I guess you know, switching it to education writ large, if you will, uh, I know that you love technology as well. And education right now, uh, clearly we are going through breakthroughs with AI, chat GPT, uh, so much information at our fingertips. How do you think education has changed and will change over the next, maybe even like three to five years because of all these breakthroughs? Well, it's interesting you give such a short time frame. I think what we're seeing now in an unprecedented way is not just the scale of change, but the speed of change. Yes. And that means we have to take a little bit of time to think through the implications of new technology. Um, I think AI potentially um, has the power to change the way we do things, just like the printing press was a, you know, a monumental yes. change, and the computer was a monumental change. And uh, let me give you a very simple example. So when I was young, um, pocket calculators came out, and there was a debate. I was at school, but I was aware of the debate. How can they be incorporated into school practice? And is it necessary for children to still learn all the algebraic rules or the new arithmetic rules when you can get a little piece, a little machine in your pocket can do it for you. And to be honest, I don't think we've actually fully answered that question. Um, but the, the challenge is to realize that a pocket calculator is now part of the world around us right. and to take that into account when planning how to, for instance, teach maths. Um, so the same applies to, let's say, 3D printing, which has revolutionized the design business. Yeah. Um, but now, um, AI and its particular manifestation, ChatGPT, has the potential to make a very, very significant change to the way we do things. Do we still want children to write essays? 
when they can put type in one line into ChatGPT, and out comes an essay which is done for them. And, and it's incredible. And that's why I compare it to the pocket calculator. Do we still want to train children to do sums when the calculator can do it for them? And having said that we haven't quite worked that out, uh, the answer is going to be a bit of both. Right. That we don't have to rely on children's computational ability, but they still have to know the rudiments of arithmetic. Sure. So similarly, um, and this is brand new, I mean, ChatGTP took its great hold about Whatever. three months ago. Yeah. So um, I think the education business, as many others, could be excused for not having quite worked out the response yet. Um, but what I think will happen is certain skills which are really drummed into students at the moment, for instance, writing essays, yes. will evolve into something different. Okay. But they will still need the rudiments of communication skills. Yeah, structure. So our, our task will be to work out how we can incorporate in positive ways and how we can avoid the negative consequences yes. of something like AI. But as you say, we haven't got a lot of time to do that. No. And do you think, also getting more specific, that there's like what I call level one thinking, which is just memorization versus maybe level two thinking, which is interpretation. Do you think there's going to be more of a focus on the interpretation aspect? Well, I think there already is. Um, our school, for instance, is part of the uh, International Baccalaureate, the okay. primary years program and the middle years program which has a great focus on, if you might say, thinking rather than just knowing. Yeah. Um, but I think that is very much the trend in education. The VCE syllabus in many subjects is evolving um, to avoid the students uh, just being able to rote learn and, and rote repeat. Uh, and there are very distinct changes in the way the VCE is structured and hence the way the VCE is taught to um, encourage the students to require the students to do some more higher level thinking and not yeah. more than just knowing stuff. And this is before AI. You go back to, I think we all use Wikipedia sure. um, as our go-to page to find things out. So I don't have to know my historical facts because I can look them up. Right. And I think education is already well ahead in taking account of this. Okay. And we're moving from a model where we have to, the kids have to know lots of stuff to a model where the students have to be able to think critically and yes. creatively and analytically about lots of stuff. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more that that is the true skill, especially in our age where, uh, let's face it, at least when uh, Sharon and I were kids, Encyclopedia Britannica was the, uh, the, the route du jour. And, and me, yes. <laughs> so uh, education, you know, continuing on with this theme, COVID education, it, it's really affected everybody, uh, from the students to the teachers, and you too. I'm just curious because you are a human being, you are, you know, you have feelings last time I checked. How has it affected you? Well, in a sense, for me and my wife personally, um, we were relatively lucky. Um, first of all, we didn't have little children at home. My yeah. own kids um, in Israel, who were also suffering their lockdowns, although not for as long as we had in Melbourne, um, it was really, really hard having little kids at home for week after week after week. And that was a huge challenge for them. And we didn't have that challenge. Because um, I was working in the school, I was actually able to go to work every day. Okay. Um, so I had no problem leaving the house and going for a walk and being out and about, which for me was a great blessing as well. Um, what I really, really missed was going to shore. Um, and not just for praying, but for, for learning and, and, and the things that one does in shore. And that was, that was a huge um, gap in my life, yeah. and I was very, very excited to get back to shore, and then we stopped again, and then we started again, and we stopped again, and started again. Um, in terms of the students in school, in my school, and I think in every school in the world, yes, um, the consequences were huge, and my belief is that we will be finding evidence of those consequences for years and years to come. I think in 10 years' time, a school will look at a particular student and say, ah, that student's going through a trouble patch, because 10 years ago was COVID, um, and maybe even for longer than 10 years. And I think our students missed out on two things in particular, but there were many ramifications further which are still coming to light. And one was education. Now, yeah. I think in my school, our teachers did a fantastic job. Um, we went onto Zoom instantly, right. and certainly for the secondary school students, we replicated the school day on Zoom. Primary school students, and particularly the younger ones, it's much, much harder because they can't see in the front of the screen, yeah. okay? Um, and you can't give them a worksheet to do if they can't read what the questions are. So it was a huge challenge for the teachers and a huge challenge for the students and their families. Um, and there's no doubt that there were gaps in their learning, which we're now trying to fill in. 
Um, but the other thing that our students of all ages missed was the socialisation. Yes. Of being together with a group of similar young people. Um, and, and you can see this throughout the school. And you can see that there are basic social skills that are either missing or just clearly um, less prominent than, than we would expect. And the way that classes, that, sorry, year levels bond together as they grow through the school, they basically miss that for two years. So there's two years less bonding. And sometimes we can see that very clearly. Yeah, you know, at those younger years, those are critical years. Absolutely. Yeah. And then the other aspect of the education process, and I was just speaking with my sister in California about this, is the teachers. That she was complaining over there that they can't get the teachers, they can't keep them there, the quality of teachers <clears throat> is dropping out, and so forth and so on. I'm sure we're seeing some similar phenomenon here. How do we handle that? Because these are the, you know, they're educating our future leaders. Indeed, we, this is very true, and we certainly in, in Victoria and in Melbourne are finding it very hard to find teachers. And we're very blessed to have a wonderful um, group of teachers in our school, but obviously there's always a need to find more teachers and to replace ones who retire. Um, and it's, it's harder, it's harder than it used to be. Um, it's a bit of a cliche to say pay teachers more, and it's not an easy thing to do, especially right. when you have to be mindful of the school budget. Sure. But I do think teachers need not necessarily more money, but I think they do need more respect. Um, and if I'm talking to our wonderful Jewish community, yeah. um, I'll go back to saying, that when our parents speak highly of teachers, it raises the level of the profession itself. It encourages our young people to consider teaching as a career. When, our, when we as a community speak ill of teachers, when we criticize harshly our children's teachers, it, it, lowers, the, um, asset, it lowers the profile, it lowers the respect yes. that we all have for our teachers, and it reduces the chances of young people deciding on that for themselves for a career. So I think we all have to be mindful of all the ways in which we can show how much we respect teachers. Teachers who do such a crucial job, not just for our children, but for our world in shaping the future and helping our young people grow and learn and navigate that future. Um, teachers really are the best, and we need to say it more often. Yeah, and I think that that's something that each and every one of mm -hmm. us can do. It's a little incremental thing. It's not far from you. It's right near to you, so that's to speak. Right. Absolutely. That I never thought about in, the, in terms of that point of view. Um, <clears throat> I want to turn towards a different subject right now. You're obviously a very learned Jewish person. And the, I, don't think, I, I wish, I wish. <laughs> and the Talmud, uh, for people that don't know, it, it's really argument, counter-argument, backing and forthing. I think that maybe the best example or well-known example is Hillel and Beis Shammai. They continuously argue with each other. But they were also best of friends. Mm -hmm. In a world today where we're so polarized, everybody's either so left or so right, and it's really breaking down families, how can we at least agree to disagree or just not have so much real hatred because I just don't agree with you? Um, it's a very good question, a very pertinent question. Um, we're looking at uh, Israel currently being sure. very divided by particular policies, um, and there seems to be an inability for one side to even hear the other. Yeah. Um, first of all, let me just point out, Hillel and Shammai had a lot of agreements, sorry, a lot of disagreements, but they were absolutely dwarfed by their agreements. Okay. Um, the, the Gemara uses a couple of times the phrase, Eilu ve'eilu divrei Elohim chayim. Both these and these are the words of the living God. Um, and people quote that line to justify two completely different positions. But that's a misuse of the phrase, because when the Talmud says both these and these are the words of the living God, they're working within a very narrow range of opinions. And it's also worth pointing out that when the Talmud says that, it carries on with the line, the halacha kebeit hilo. In other words, we have different opinions, but right. at the end of the day, only one of them is valid. So it's important to say that the great Talmudic debates right. were taking place within a context of an absolutely shared set of axioms, right. which every participant agreed to, and if they didn't, they're not part of the conversation. Okay. Um, and I think that perhaps is part of my answer to your bigger okay. question that I think whenever people are disagreeing, there should be a set of values or axioms, if you like, from a mathematical point of view, on which they agree. And if they don't, then unfortunately, there's no point in a dialogue. Right. Um, I would also say, and I, I realize I might sound a bit like a Luddite here, but I blame social media very much for the culture of disagreement that we have. That there, when, when the internet started, some of us had a, this dream that there would be this great 
Socratic debate that we could all sit in our living rooms and share ideas, and from that would come better ideas. And that's how civilization has always developed. Right. That one person has an idea, another person has a slightly different idea, they talk about it, and they get a better idea between the two of them. Healthy competition. Almost. Exactly. But what happens now on the internet is one person shouts at everybody else, right. and anyone who disagrees with them is to be put down in brutal and, and horrible terms, right. and leaving absolutely no room, not only for um, respect, but for sharing and growing of ideas. And, and what is so crucial is when we have debates, is to say, we agree on this, 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 and this, right. we disagree within this particular area, let's work out how we can get some sort of resolution. Right. Having said that, um, I'm no proponent of council culture, however, there are some ideas which are beyond the pale. Um, if somebody is racist, there's no point in talking to them, and there's no saying, well, I'll be a little bit less... A little bit less... <coughs> I'll just move yeah. over a little bit. There are bit. certainly some... Um, positions which are beyond the pale, and we need to make that clear. However, we need to distinguish between those and positions which we merely disagree with, right. which are not beyond the pale. And we need to be clear to ourselves and to others that this is within the grounds of legitimate debate. How exactly we get from here to there, I'm not quite sure, right. but we need to keep trying. Yeah, and do you think that also this leads to anti-Semitism? There's a massive rise in anti-Semitism, unless you're, you haven't noticed, which is pretty hard to say. Well, I, I think there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, I, I actually, sadly, I think anti-Semitism is, is built into the fabric of civilization um, for reasons I'm not entirely sure. I think after the Shoah, there was a, we, we, when I grew up in 1964, I was born, uh, and I didn't encounter anti-Semitism in, in my life growing right. up. And, and I think, with hindsight, we thought that the dragon of anti-Semitism had been fully slain but it turns out it was just dormant, and it's now coming back to right. its natural position, and I think that's what we're seeing now. Um, I think the internet and this inability to listen to other people's points of view certainly does encourage extremists, encourages crazy conspiracy theories, right. um, it encourages hatred of others, and anti-Semitism falls into all those categories and many more. So it's not surprising, but anti-Semitism is one of the things, one of the evils that is growing in our time of intolerance. And is there anything I know that this is a very hard question, but that we can do to, even if it's in people's fabrics, to at least not have it so prevalent? Um, what can we do to make anti-Semitism less prevalent? Um, Putting I, you on the spot there. Yes, I, I, I don't have a, an okay. answer to that. Uh, one thing that for sure is not to run away and hide. Right. It's not to take the view that uh, I'm going to play down my Jewishness um, because I'm afraid that people won't like me, or, or worse. Um, we should be proud Jews. Um, the late Chief Rabbi Jonathan Sachs often repeated that non-Jews respect when Jews are proud of their Judaism. Right. And I think it's very true, and I think we need to remember that. I, I couldn't agree more, but one of the most frustrating aspects I find, and especially, obviously, I'm American, so I find it with the American Jew, Jewish community in a lot of ways, is what I'd call apathy. That what a lot of people are finding now, especially on college campuses, are, I'm really not affiliated in any Jewish way, I haven't even had a bar about mitzvah, I don't care, I think that, I see these social media posts of the, <clears throat> the Israeli army doing things and so forth and so on, it's all just too hard. <coughs> and it, it reminds me of the Pesach, we just finished there with one of the four questions, which is, you know, the one that really doesn't care, so to speak. What do we say to that person? Because I feel like that that is one of the areas where we can do better, is to, say, is to say, save these... Well, in a kids. sense, that's the task of my current role and in a wider sense, the task of my life, okay. which is to encourage not just a Jewish identity, but a Jewish identification, to encourage young people to connect right. to Jewish community and to Jewish life and to Judaism. Um, and again, I don't have yeah. any quick fixes. No. Um, but I do feel that it's critical for the future of the Jewish world that the next generation is connected and is engaged and feels passionately about their future and the future of Jewish life and the future of Israel. Um, and I fear greatly for those who are apathetic today, yeah. as you put it, they're like the fourth child of the Seder who's not interested, or maybe even like the fifth child of the Seder who's not even there. <laughs> and they're the ones who are in this age where we have to choose to be Jewish 
and we have to choose to build Jewish life and Jewish lives. The ones who are apathetic are the ones who we can see it before us, we don't need to make a prediction, who are assimilating, disconnecting, and whose, uh, as one measure of Jewish engagement, whose children will not be Jewish and whose grandchildren will certainly not be Jewish. Um, that, that is what we're seeing before our eyes. But we know that the ones who remain connected and engaged and infused are going to be the Jewish future. For sure. And I guess it's a segue, Rabbi, <clears throat> you're leaving us here in Australia, but your legacy is going to be here. Going forward, Kuyang Road in Caulfield, can you just talk to us about your thoughts about it? Well, we're working towards um, a, an agreement with the state government that Mount Scopus will, in the future, move to the current site of Corporate Hospital. Um, the details of what would happen to the hospital will be rebuilt, um, is yet to be decided. Um, and this will be an absolute game changer for Mount Scopus and I believe for the community, because it will provide Mount Scopus with a purpose-built, state-of-the-art campus um, in the heart of the Jewish community. Right. Um, and it will also provide a beautiful suite of facilities for the community itself to use. So it's taken a long time to get to this point. Right. Uh, and we're not quite there yet. Um, and obviously the construction will take a while after that as well. So it will be long after my time in Mount Scopus. Um, but when it happens, it will be um, of tremendous value to not just the Scopus community, but to the wider Jewish community. Yeah, and I think that the word that comes to my mind is connection. Mm -hmm. And it goes back to your point about that we have to have a reason to be Jewish. Mm -hmm. So, Rabbi, thank you so much for your time. Just in closing, if there were just one or two thoughts that you have, you've been here for 17 years, uh, what would they be? Australia's a wonderful place. Melbourne's a wonderful place, and the Melbourne Jewish community is thriving, it's active, and it's been very welcoming to Vicky and to me. Um, at the risk of raining on the parade just a little bit, um, I think it needs to have some serious strategic thinking about the future. Right. And to echo your point, the most important task for educators, for leaders, for parents, for everyone, is to divert resources and expertise and planning into keeping those young people engaged. And I would say, I think our school, and I think all the Jewish schools, do a wonderful job, but it's after they leave school that there's a distinct lack of provision. Um, it's helped by a few organizations. I want to pay tribute to Awesome, which I think does a great job in engaging post-school young Jewish people. But as a community, we need to do much, much more, not just for schools, but for that post-school era to keep those young people connected because it's, it's, it's such an, it's not even a cliche, it's more obvious than that. They are the future. And as you say, if we allow them to disengage, we yeah. are losing our own future. So that I would say is the number one priority for this community as it is for every community. Right. Rabbi, thank you so much.